In this video, I want to talk about the last of the isomorphism theorems, which is the fourth isomorphism theorem, but is often called the lattice isomorphism theorem. So first I'll tell you uh, what the theorem says, and then I'll tell you something about the proof, and then I'll draw you a picture that explains why this is often called the lattice isomorphism theorem. Okay, so let's start with a normal subgroup N of a group G. There is a bijection between the set of all subgroups A of G that contain N and the set of all subgroups A bar of that are uh, given as A mod N of G bar, which we're going to call uh, G mod N. So we know G mod N is a group because N is normal in G. Let's call that G bar. And there's this correspondence between subgroups A of G and subgroups A bar of G bar where A bar can be described in terms of A as A mod N. And remember, this is something we talked about in the previous video. Uh, N is normal in G. So it's also a normal subgroup of any subgroup A that contains N. OK, so what is this correspondence? A goes to A bar. So what does this mean? In particular, every subgroup of G bar is of the form A mod N for some subgroup A of G containing N. So if you want to understand all the subgroups of a quotient, then you need to understand all the subgroups of the original group that contain the thing that you're quotienting by. But it's not like you take a quotient and then all of a sudden there's some new way to pick up subgroups. Every subgroup of G bar comes from a subgroup of G in this way. So I'll point out that this uh, fact is really useful. And this comes up in um, I know things in my research life uh, pretty frequently. OK, so this is this bijection between uh, subgroups of G containing N and then subgroups of G bar. What kind of properties does this correspondence, does this bijection have? So uh, Dummett and Foote give a list. For example, A is a subgroup of B. If you have two subgroups, uh, A and B, that both contain N, then A is a subgroup of B if and only if A bar is a subgroup of B bar. If A is a subgroup of B and these both contain N, then the index of A and B is the same as the index of B bar and A bar. So this bijection preserves the index. So here's one about taking the um, subgroup generated by a subset. So if you take the subgroup generated by A and B, two subgroups containing N, and then you take the subgroup of G bar that corresponds to that, that's the same as if you take the subgroup of G bar corresponding to A, the subgroup of G bar corresponding to B bar, and then ask for the subgroup that they generate in G bar. OK, same kind of thing. You take A intersect B and ask what subgroup uh, of G bar does that correspond to? It corresponds to the intersection of A bar and B bar. And then this correspondence preserves normality. So uh, if A is this subgroup containing N, A is normal in G, if and only if A bar is normal in G bar. So I'm not going to do all the details of the proofs. I'll say a little about it. And in fact, I'll say a little more about it than uh, Dummett and Foote do. But the big idea here is to consider the natural projection, this special homomorphism from G to G mod N that has N as the kernel, where we just take an element, little g, to the left coset of N containing G. So the big idea is going to go through understanding this natural projection homomorphism. So I'll pause and erase and say a little bit more about the proof. So let's say a little bit more about the proof. We have this big idea that we're going to consider the natural projection from G to G mod N. This is a surjective homomorphism whose kernel is N. So let's suppose that we have a subgroup over on the right-hand side. Let's call it A bar. It's a subgroup of G bar. And we're going to consider the inverse image of this subgroup under this natural projection homomorphism. So now 
I want to mention an exercise that I talked about in office hours on Thursday. That is exercise one in section 3.1. It says that if you have the inverse image of a subgroup under a homomorphism, that's also a subgroup. So one example of that is like if you take the trivial subgroup on the right, the inverse image is the kernel. So we know that's a subgroup. So that means that pi inverse, the inverse image of this subgroup A bar, is a subgroup of G. And we saw in office hours that you can check this really easily using the subgroup criterion. So this is not uh, a difficult thing. But the exercise says more. It says that if you have a normal subgroup over on the right-hand side, then the inverse image is also a normal subgroup of G. So if A bar is a normal subgroup of G mod N, then pi inverse of A bar is a normal subgroup of G. OK, so let's give this subgroup pi inverse of the inverse image uh, of A bar under pi. Let's call that A. So we also know, this is something else I mentioned in office hours, that if you take this homomorphism and you restrict it to a subgroup, meaning it is the same everywhere it's defined, but now instead of having the domain be all of G, we're going to have it be the subgroup A. We get this homomorphism called pi restricted to A. And that's going to take in something in A. And because of the way we defined A, that's going to output something in A bar. So it's a surjective homomorphism uh, onto A bar. Um, a is the set of all of the things in G where you apply pi to them and you land in A bar. So OK, so this is going to A bar. This is now a surjective homomorphism. And the kernel is n. So the first isomorphism theorem is now going to tell us that A mod n is isomorphic to A bar. So this is a way to see that every subgroup of G mod n corresponds to some subgroup A of G, which one? The inverse image under this natural projection homomorphism. And the inverse image under the natural projection homomorphism is definitely going to contain n. So uh, that's sort of the first big part of proving this fourth isomorphism theorem. So I'll leave the rest of the details as an exercise, uh, like is done in Dominant Foot. No individual piece of this is particularly difficult, and you now have all of the tools to work out a full proof. So I'll pause and erase, and I'll draw you a picture to show you why this is called the lattice isomorphism theorem. The last thing I want to do in this video is explain why the fourth isomorphism theorem is often called the lattice isomorphism theorem. So let's take the lattice of subgroups of Q8, the quaternion group of size 8. We've drawn this before. It's got the subgroup generated by i, by j, by k. These all have size 4. These are these index 2 subgroups. We have the subgroup generated by minus 1, which has size 2. This is the center of Q8. And then we have the trivial subgroup at the bottom. So uh, the center is normal in the whole group. So let's call the whole group G. The center is going to be n. So let's look at G mod n. So that's Q8 mod the subgroup generated by minus 1. This is a group of size 4, right? Because Q8 has size 8, n has size 2. So uh, what do the elements look like? Well, let's pick a non-identity element, like the left coset of n containing i. That has order 2. The left coset of n containing j, left coset of n containing k, those are three distinct non-identity elements. And then we have the identity the left coset of n containing n itself. So what are we seeing? We have this, uh, this group is isomorphic to z2 cross z2. It's easy to see that it's order 4 and it's not cyclic. Well, the lattice isomorphism theorem tells us that subgroups of g containing n correspond to subgroups of g mod n. So where are the subgroups of g containing n? Well, in the lattice, uh, the subgroup diagram, we have n, and then we have everything above n, everything that n leads to going above and then up from there. And these up here are all of the subgroups of G containing n. So what does this correspondence tell us? Is we're getting a copy of the lattice of subgroups of G mod n 
in the lattice of subgroups of G in the part above N. So that's why this is called the lattice isomorphism theorem. In the book, there's another nice diagram uh, for D8, and I would definitely encourage you to check that out.